Nick, are we ready to go? Yeah, should we get started? Yeah, go ahead. OK. OK. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 10th uh, ECS and Cloud Feedback Virtual Symposium. I'm Jonah Block Johnson. I'm one of the organizers. Um, we have a great series of talks for you today. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to go over some logistics. So uh, the format for uh, today's symposium will be three AGU style talks. There'll be some times for questions after each talk. And then at the end, we'll have a short general Q&A session. Uh, you should all be muted right now, but if you have any questions, please just type them into the chat. Or if you'd like to ask your question live, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you. If you would like to present in the future, uh, please reach out to uh, one of the committee members. Uh, you can find our contact information as well as videos of past talks, uh, information on how to sign up for the mailing list, uh, and more on the website for the symposium. And with that, I will give it over to Nick. Oh, I thought you were doing introductions, Jonah. Oh, sorry, um, I thought I was. <laughs> no worries. Um, so our first speaker is Ivan Mitevsky, who's a grad student at Columbia. Uh, Evan, do you want to share your screen? Yes. Um, Uh, okay, can you see my presentation? Yep. Okay, hi, I'm Ivan Metevsky. I'm a graduate student at Columbia. I work with Lorenzo Polvani and Clara Orby, and I'll be presenting some recent work we, we published in GRL about non-monotonic response of the climate system to abrupt CO2 forcing. Most previous studies are focused on the doubling scenarios, a half two times CO2, four, and eight times CO2. It makes sense. The radiated forcing is log dependence on the CO2 concentration. But when we look at the CO2 concentration time series in SSP 8.5 scenario, we see that around 2100, we would be around four times CO2, uh, the, the pre-industrial value. And around 2200, we will be around almost eight times CO2. So we would like to explore the whole range N times CO2 with N being one and a half, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight times CO2. We, we also go beyond ECS and analyze the response of uh, sea ice, precipitation, and the atmospheric circulation. We use two models, fully coupled atmosphere ocean models. One is the GIST E2.1G model, which is the official CIMIP6 version of the GIST model, and the large ensemble version of the CSM model. We do fully coupled runs for 150 years. We also do fixed SSD runs to diagnose the effective radiative forcing as per Forster et al. 2016. Uh, we do them for 30 years. And we also do some slab ocean runs. Some equations we all know. Earth's energy balance, delta R is F plus lambda delta T. And the way we calculate ECS effective here is minus F over lambda where F is calculated from the two times CO2 fixed SSD runs. And lambda is calculated from the 150 year Gregory regression. Results don't change whether lambda is calculated from year one to 150 or 20 to 150. So here is the Gregory regression. Left is the GIST model and right is the CSM model. So let's focus on the left GIST model. So we see at the lower forcing scenarios from one, one and a half times CO2, all the way to the dark blue here at eight times CO2, we see this kind of weakening of the slope. So lambda gets, gets less negative, right? But when we look at in the intermediate uh, CO2 scenarios, especially at three times CO2 in lime, we see this between two and three, we have this increase in, in slope, like the slope is steepening. And this happens at three times CO2 in guess. And similar happens at CSM, except at at the CSM, it happens at four times CO2, shown in red. Here are shown ECS effective and the total feedbacks lambda for the GIS and the CSM model. So let's focus on lambda for the GIS model. So lambda for the GIS model at two times CO2 starts at minus 1.62, and all the way at eight, eight times CO2 is at minus 
Since ECS effective is just, in, uh, it's just in inversely proportional to lambda, it goes from 2.24 to almost 3, which is consistent with other papers. ECS effective increases with CO2. However, if we look at the intermediate scenarios, we see that at 3 times CO2, lambda has a minimum at minus 1.86. So uh, equivalently, ECS effective has also a minimum at 3 times CO2. Similar happens as CSM, except at four times CO2. So ECS effective increases with CO2, consistent with other papers, but the increase is non monotonic with a kink at three times CO2 for GIS and four times CO2 for the CSM model. When we do this with the slab ocean runs, the non monotonicity disappears. So these are numbers. Next, we're going to show some maps and other climate variables which also have this sort of kink at these particular CO2 values. So next, this is, these are surface temperature response annual, um, last 50 years of the simulation. Left is GIS, right is the CSM model. So if you focus on GIS model at three times CO2, we see this abnormally, abnormally large uh, North Atlantic warming hole, which have this abnormal cooling, which kind of uh, goes away at higher forcings. Similar at CSM model, at four times CO2, we have this large North Atlantic warming hole. And this, this, both of these large North Atlantic warming holes coincide with the same kink we saw in ECS. So next we look at the AMOC response, the ocean. So top left is the GIS model, top right is the CSM model. So this is AMOC and sphere drops, a function of years. So AMOC at pre-industrial hovers around 28 sphere drops. At one and a half times CO2, shown in, in green, weakens a bit. Then at two times CO2, weakens by year 50, and then it bounces back. And then AMOC at three times CO2, shown in lime, shuts down and doesn't come back. AMOC for any higher forcing than three times CO2, it shuts down and doesn't come back. Similar with the CSM model, except the shutdown happens at four times CO2, shown in red, and any higher forcing. So we have two models, and AMOC collapses in both of them. But if you look at the CIMIP6 models down here, we see that in the four time, abrupt four times CO2 scenario, we see that a lot of the CMIP6 models also exhibit similar behavior. AMOC shuts down. So next, we look at CIS extent. Left is the GIS model, right is the CSM model. And uh, X here, we have the radiative forcing, which is the log formula of the CO2 concentration. We also have the, the CO2 axis. So if we focus on red, which is the Northern Hemisphere CIS extent response annual, um, from PI, we see from PI to two times CO2, we see uh, CIS extent decreases. And then between two and three times CO2, we have CIS increase. So CIS extent is higher at three times CO2 than at one and a half or two. And then CIS uh, extent decreases at higher forcings, at higher CO2 values. In Southern Hemisphere, we have non monotonic decrease of CIS extent. Similarly happens in the CSM model, except between three and four times CO2. Next, we look at the map. Top is the GIS model, bottom is the CSM model. So notice here at three times CO2, CIS extent response annual, uh, we see this blue. So there's more CIS extent at three times CO2 than it would be at pre-industrial in this particular area. And similar at CSM, except around at four times CO2. So next is precipitation. So left of this plot is the GIS model, right is the CSM, and top is the fully coupled model runs, and bottom is the slab ocean. So focus on top left, precipitation response. Uh, red is northern hemisphere, blue is southern hemisphere. So focus on the northern hemisphere. As we increase CO2 up to two times CO2, precipitation increases. But between two and three, we have this decrease in precipitation. And, and then precipitation increases at higher forcings. And at southern hemisphere, precipitation just monotonically increases at higher CO2 values. Similarly, with the CSM model, we have, uh, we have this kink between three and four times CO2 in Northern Hemisphere precipitation response. Contrasting this with the slab ocean runs, slab ocean runs exhibit no such kink. So next, we look at the width of the tropics. Width of the tropics is expected to, to widen it higher at, at, at the warmer planet. And here we look at the edge of the dry zones. Precipitation minus evaporation equals zero. Same types of plots. Left is guess right is CSM, top is fully coupled, and bottom is slab ocean. So we focus on the uh, northern hemisphere uh, response in, uh, shown in red, 
we see that the tropics expand, edge of the dry zones goes uh, poleward at two times U2. Then between two and three, we see we have less poleward shift at three than when we see at two. And then it goes down and then it comes back up at higher CO2 values. In the southern hemisphere, edge of the dry zones just monotonically moves poleward. Similar happens at the CSI model, except this kind of kink occurs between three and four times CO2. Slab ocean rounds exhibit no such behavior, no such kinks, just monotonically widening. So next is the Halley cell strength. Same types of plots, uh, top left, GIST model, red, the northern hemisphere, Halley cell strength. We see Halley cell strength from PI going down to two times CO2, Halley cell strength weakens. But between two and three times CO2, Halley cell strength strengthens. At three times CO2, we have a stronger Halley cell than what we have at PI. And then Halley cell strength uh, declines at higher CO2 values. In, south, in, uh, in the southern hemisphere, shown in blue, we have the Halley cell strength to just be monotonically decreasing. On the right, we see the, uh, the CSM model, which exhibits the same behavior except between three and four times CO2. Again, contrasting this with the slab ocean runs, they just show the Halley cell strength to be monotonically decreasing at, at higher CO2 values, which leads us to believe is the ocean dynamics that, that, that contributes to this kink. But we only, run the, uh, we only run the models for 150 years, and model takes uh, longer to equilibrate. So here we extend the GIS model runs for two, three, and four times CO2 up to 300 years, and we show the AMOC. So AMOC does not come back in these runs for three and four times CO2, does not come back up to year 300. In fact, the modeling center ran above four times CO2 from the same model for 1,200 years, and AMOC did not come back. So we have no reason to believe that AMOC will come back in these runs. So to summarize, we examine the response of the climate system to abrupt one and a half, two, three, four, five, six, and seven times, and eight times CO2 forcing with two different couple models. We see that the climate sensitivity, CS extent, precipitation, and the atmospheric circulation respond non-monotonically across this range of CO2 up to 300 years. The non-monotonicity is associated with changes in the ocean dynamics, notably over the North Atlantic. There's been a lot of works on the pattern effects in the Pacific, but here we also see that the North Atlantic and the North Atlantic warming hole contributes to this non-monotonic behavior of ECS and many other variables. A big caveat to our findings is that this is only done with two models up to 150 years, uh, and then ex they extend the ones to 300 years. So it'd be great if, if um, we're looking forward to our colleagues doing uh, the similar experiments with other uh, models and see whether this uh, non-monotonic behavior uh, appears there as well. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Ivan. That was a great talk. We have some questions in the chat. Um, um, the first is from William von Weingarten, who asks, what causes the increase in sea ice in the Northern Hemisphere when CO2 increases by a factor of three? The North Atlantic warming hole cooling. It's, it's abnormally large. And the AMOC shuts down at exactly the same, uh, exactly at the same forcing, and we have this cooling, and the cooling contributes to it. Okay, and then Dennis Hartman asks: Is the behavior dependent on the abruptness of the forcing onset? Excellent question. We're looking to explore that with with transient runs as well, and and see whether that would appear. Uh, so yes, it could be due to the abruptness of the forcings. Okay, maybe, and then uh, Andres Schmittner raised his hand. Andres, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I had a similar question to Dennis. Um, um, I, I think, I mean, I remember that um, for the exponential four times CO2 increase uh, experiments, I don't think that uh, the AMOC collapses in many of the models. So it, that kind of would indicate that it is due to the rate of change. So the abruptness of the forcing and so, it reminded me of a paper we published like more than 20 years ago that showed that the AMOC collapse depends on the rate of forcing in a very simple model. So in the RCP 8.5, in the SSP 8.5, AMOC does weaken in a lot of the models as well. Um, so we, right, we did weakened, see... But it doesn't collapse, right, in, in many of those. Right. The, 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 the immediate collapse more, is more expressed in the abrupt forcings, yes. 
Okay, we have one last question from our next speaker, Jen Kay, who asks, do you think the initial condition in the ocean could affect your results? Are you using the same initial conditions for all runs? Yes, we do use all the initial conditions for the same, uh, for, for all the runs. But we, we, we did it with two models, right? We did it with the GIS model and with the CSM. So um, it's two different models, right? We, we see the same behavior. So that kind of, yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think there's more questions in the chat, but we should move on. And uh, yeah, so I think Jen is gonna be our next speaker. Sure. I gotta wait for uh, Yvonne to stop sharing. Oh, okay. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, nice talk. Thanks. All right, do you see my screen? Yep. So we're gonna continue along a similar line of thinking about how the climate and cloud responses to idealized greenhouse warming and cooling differ. Here, I'm just looking at one model and uh, the differences between a doubling and a halving, uh, but with a particular focus on the cloud responses um, in these models. And I think it'll be complementary and stimulating after hearing Yvonne's talk. So the first thing I'll show is just that we have about 20% more global warming uh, than global cooling in CESM1. Uh, like Yvonne, we ran these experiments uh, for 150 years uh, following some CMIP6 protocols that were laid out from CFMIP and non-LINMIP. Um, it's important to point out that after 150 years, of course, these models are not equilibrated. And you know, one of the motivations is for thinking about, for example, last glacial maximum climate. And obviously this is not an equilibrated climate state. Um, yet I think it's still interesting and relevant. Uh, I've only attended one other uh, ECS symposium, but there was some discussion about just how much more warming and cooling would you need to rule out high e ECS values. And I think this 20% number is, is not high enough to rule out high ECS um, numbers, but, um, but it's certainly more warming than cooling. So uh, we address why uh, we see this uh, more warming than cooling. Uh, we diagnose the effect of radiative forcing using fixed SST experiments. We find it's about 10% larger for the doubling than the halving. So definitely it's a little bit more of a punch when you double than when you have CO2. Uh, we also looked at the radiative feedbacks um, using kernels and also APRP for shortwave um, cloud feedbacks. And uh, what we see is that the shortwave cloud feedback uh, is definitely important for explaining this more warming than cooling, uh, although it is compensated somewhat uh, by the lapse rate feedback, um, which tends to be um, a little bit less negative in the having experiment than in the doubling experiment. So uh, we also looked at some maps to try to assess what was going on. Here, just looking at the doubling and the halving, we see many familiar patterns. This is a very nice response. You know, the high latitudes, larger magnitude than the lower latitudes, the land more than the ocean, um, some of the tropical um, Pacific patterns. You know, there's even some similarities between the halving and the doubling. Um, the kind of opposite response in the North Atlantic uh, associated with the AMOC changes. Um, if we look at the differences, though, we start to see there are some pretty large differences, in particular in the high latitudes where sea ice has been lost or gained. Uh, we see more warming over land um, than cooling. And uh, of course, some interesting um, spatial patterns uh, that we can emphasize by looking at the pattern difference. Here, we're just normalizing by the global mean response. And in particular, in the north, um, Pacific, there's some interesting interactions on um, the sea ice edge is creeping equatorward in the halving experiment, which is causing this, you know, more cooling um, than warming. Um, but then also off the coast of North America, um, we see this um, cooling ex signal extended and we didn't do this in the study, but I think it'd be interesting to do a diagnostics on what exactly is happening here in the North Atlantic in the time evolution. And we'll see this interaction between um, this cooling and cloud feedbacks um, in subsequent plots. But so there's a lot of richness to these experiments. Um, we just tried to pick out some highlights and explain what we were seeing. 
We also looked at maps of the radiative feedbacks um, to try to help explain the surface temperature pattern differences. Um, so on the left, uh, you'll see the two times CO2 feedbacks that are probably familiar to many. Um, in the middle, we have the difference um, between the doubling and having feedbacks. So you see um, in the high latitudes, for example, where the sea ice has been lost or gained, there's strong um, reinforcement of that signature um, by the linked surface albedo and lapse rate feedbacks. Um, we also see a rich uh, structure to the cloud feedback difference, uh, in particular, you know, larger cloud feedbacks over land. And we see this um, signature off the coast of North America, this cooling feedback um, that's, uh, that's more strong in the halving than in the, the doubling. So um, a lot of interesting um, signatures to see here. Um, but it's also interesting to look at the tropical oceans. Um, they kind of get washed out in the global mean plots because their pattern um, and their scale is much uh, smaller than the higher latitudes. But of course, they have large impacts, so it's important to understand them. Here, I'm just contrasting um, the SST response um, in the doubling and the halving and the colors and the wind responses um, in the vectors. And I was really shocked when I saw this plot. They look so similar in terms of their response. Um, and you know, we're going from a doubling to a halving CO2. This is pretty different um, climate states. If we do look at their difference, though, we start to see um, that, for example, the Western Tropical Pacific is warming more than it's cooling. We're getting more um, warming than cooling along the equator. And then off the equator, especially in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, um, some interesting signatures um, that appear to be related um, not to necessarily uh, the wind forcing. In particular, if we look at this kind of cooling spot um, off the coast of North America that had been noted before. I want to emphasize that the wind vectors here are not helping us explain, for example, the enhanced warming in the Western Tropical Pacific. Um, but if we start to look at, for example, the cloud feedback differences um, and secondarily the water vapor and lapse rate feedback differences, we do start to see a role for cloud feedbacks um, in explaining um, the patterns of the difference between warming and cooling under doubled and halving of CO2. We also looked a bit at the time evolution. Again, we only have 150 years, but you know the first 25 years, 75% of the response happens. So it's interesting to contrast kind of the long time scales and the short time scales. Um, if we look at this slow time scale response on the left, we just have the fraction of the response. Um, so here, um, the kind of cooler colors indicate a slow response, and the warmer colors um, indicate a fast response. Um, I thought it was really notable that the Southern Ocean, for example, is, you know, we always talk about delayed Southern Ocean warming, and here it is being the fastest thing to respond um, when we have CO2. So definitely a role, I think, for the sea ice, um, perhaps ocean stratification as well. Um, also the North Pacific, um, we see some um, very slow behavior in the halving simulation as the sea ice edge is creeping equatorward. Um, so that's kind of, kind of interesting. If we look at the magnitude of the slow change, you know, it kind of reflects the magnitude of the total change with larger amplitudes in the higher latitudes than in the tropics, but certainly um, some slow change um, happening at all latitudes. The ocean dynamics and the cloud feedbacks appear to be very important for explaining the tropical SST um, response and including its time evolution. Um, so here we're just looking at the slow minus fast pattern um, for both the doubling and the halving. And we can see, you know, in general, um, the Western Tropical Pacific tends to be fast. The Eastern Tropical Pacific tends to be slow. Part, part of that is just the delayed, um, uh, the upwelling of kind of waters that are out of equilibrium and that slowly creeping um, uh, towards um, the Central Pacific. Um, but there's definitely a role for clouds in this too. Uh, if we look at the cloud feedback um, and contrast the slow and fast time scales, we see a lot of spatial patterns um, that look similar to the SST patterns um, for the doubling and having and their time evolution. There's a nice uh, cover page on nature climate change uh, this month. Um, whether clouds are warm, will warm or cool the planet or climate change is uncertain. Um, there's two really nice papers um, by folks who I think are on this call. I highly recommend um, checking them out. But I will use this as a segue to say that cloud feedbacks are really uncertain. And so to the extent that you know, these differences between doubling and having are reliant on cloud feedbacks, I sort of take it all with a bit of grain of salt. 
So we're going to do something um, kind of fun. We're just going to disable the cloud radiative feedbacks and see if we start to see similar responses. So we're using an established protocol um, where we just kind of bypass um, the clouds and radiation that are predicted by the model, instead um, prescribe them from a reference run. And so basically we're disabling any um, cloud radiative feedbacks. Um, the clouds are just going to stay fixed at this reference run, um, which is consistent with an 1850 um, pre-industrial control climate. So um, disabling the cloud feedbacks um, decreases the global response. So we get less global warming and less global cooling. Um, and that's consistent with the cloud feedbacks being diagnosed as positive in this model. But what's interesting is we still get 20% more global warming than global cooling without cloud radiative feedbacks. Um, so there's some processes that are coming into play here, um, in particular, potentially cloud influence on non-cloud feedbacks um, that enable the climate system to still have more warming than cooling in response to a doubling of CO2 than a halving of CO2. I want to point out that it's really fun to diagnose this cloud influence on the system, which we do just by differencing the control with the cloud blocked experiments. And this um, shows the influence of clouds on not only the sort of their local radiative feedback, but also the coupling with circulation and their influence on non cloud feedbacks. And the pattern differs quite a lot um, from cloud feedbacks diagnosed offline. In fact, if you look at pattern correlations, it's pretty small. Um, it's notable, for example, at the high latitudes um, that we see, you know, when we disable cloud feedbacks, we're getting more um, warming at high latitudes or cooling at high latitudes. Um, and that is definitely the coupling of the clouds with the circulation. If we look um, at this cloud influence, uh, we see that it actually affects the response magnitude a lot more than it affects the response pattern. Indeed, if we do global pattern correlations um, between the simulations um, with and without cloud radiative feedbacks, we find um, really high pattern correlations um, between their responses. Um, but there's definitely more of a response when the cloud feedbacks are active. Uh, finally, we looked at the tropical SST differences with and without cloud feedbacks. Um, and so here we just see, you know, this more warming um, than cooling, both in the top, in the control, we've seen this plot before, in the middle um, with the clouds not um, enabled, so the disabled cloud run or cloud locked run. And then on the bottom, um, the difference between the control and the cloud locked run. And we see again, you know, it's notable the Western tropical Pacific warms more due to cloud radiative feedbacks and these differences um, in the spatial pattern um, in the Eastern tropical Pacific uh, associated with enabling cloud feedbacks. So just by way of summary, um, globally, we're, we're seeing about 20% more CO2 doubling warming um, than CO2 having cooling. And that's irrespective of whether we have clouds active or disabled in our simulations. Um, at the high latitudes, the linked lapse rate and surface albedo feedbacks and ocean um, control um, the high latitude surface temperature responses and their differences. Um, the tropical Pacific seems kind of unique in that it's really shaped by um, the cloud feedbacks in terms of its spatial pattern. Um, the eastern tropical Pacific response is slow when compared to the western tropical Pacific. Um, and there's a lot of interesting interactions between the clouds, um, the surface winds, and the ocean dynamics there. And finally, um, disabling cloud radiative feedbacks affects the response magnitude more than the response pattern. And one exception there is the tropical Pacific. Um, this work has been um, submitted to Journal of Climate. The lead author, Jason Chalmers, is now a graduate student at the University of Santa Barbara, um, but he and I are working um, to get it published, and we really welcome um, your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That was a, that was a really great talk. Um, it looks like we have a question from Minaj. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself? And... Hello. Hi, Jennifer, that's a really interesting talk. I've got a question about the South Asian monsoon or the South Asian, it seems to be nonlinear and it seems to be slow, but the rest of the Indian Ocean looks to be fast. So is it coming from the Eastern Pacific? It looks quite interesting what's going on there. I have no idea, but I would be happy to share the simulations with you if you would like to diagnose it. I think that's one of the fun things about these um, types of projects. You know, there's so many interesting responses and, um, yeah, it, I certainly don't think that we've explained everything um, that we've seen um, in these patterns. Um, I've, we focus more on the tropical Pacific, 
Um, and then also uh, on the high latitudes where um, I have more expertise, <laughs> but happy to send them, send me an email. I shall send you an email after I've finished marking in months. Okay. <laughs> sure thing. Thanks. Let's see. We also have um, a question from Rob Wood wants to know how the forcing compares, the instantaneous rate of forcing compares between the uh, doubling and halving of CO2. I don't know if that's something you have there. Yeah, I mean, we diagnosed the effective rate of forcing following guidance from Forster et al. So I think like Yvonne, we ran 30 year um, Experiments. Um, I will say it's kind of fun, and Rob, I think you'll appreciate this. We also did those experiments with the cloud feedbacks um, disabled. And um, what we found is um, that the clouds um, are actually enhancing the forcing. Um, so they're part of the rapid adjustment and part of the effective radiative forcing. So um, we, I guess that's sort of a backhanded way of estimating the, the instantaneous radiative forcing. I don't know, someone should correct me if I'm wrong. I always get these definitions a little bit confused, but I think when you disable the rapid feedbacks from clouds, um, you're starting to see part of the effective radiative forcing that's due to those fast adjustments of clouds removed. Yeah, I don't, I, I guess that's, thanks for the response. I guess I'm just wondering, should they, should we expect them to be the same? Is, was there some, there's, there seemed to be some implicit expectation that these should be the same. You know the responses. Yeah, I mean, I think this doubling having um, CO two framework, and Yvonne showed this very nicely too. As you go to larger forcings, you know, there's you know guidance from the 1990 IPCC report that says that it's log linear um, the forcing with CO two, but actually it's not. It's a little bit off from that, and I think that's an important um, thing to be able to calculate. And it's been highlighted in papers recently. I'm happy to share our submitted paper to Journal Climate, where we have you know the latest references on that. And there may be other people on the call that can address that in the chat too. Thanks. Okay, we have a question from Gavin Schmidt. How about CSM2? Well, there's cloud locking capabilities in CESM2. I think it'd be quite fun to disable the cloud feedbacks in CESM2, especially given how crazy they are and how much they're increasing the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So yeah, maybe a project to, to take on. Um, and then I, let's, let's just do this last question from Kyle here. Is there a role for ocean stratification under two times versus half having a CO2 and causing that enhanced surface warming? Yeah, I think ocean stratification would be really fun to look at in these runs, um, especially over the Southern Ocean too, Kyle, which I know you're interested in. And, you know, we cite your paper for the delayed Southern Ocean warming, but I don't know if you're surprised or intrigued by the fact that Southern Ocean is, is um, fast to cool. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to look at the stratification also there um, and the CA's response as well. Thanks, Jen. Um, I think we have uh, one more one more speaker now. So why don't we, if, if there's any more, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's uh, let's we'll continue this discussion later during the, the Q and A session. But thanks again. That was a, that was a great talk. Um, the uh, oh, sorry. The final speaker uh, is. Zhang Lei, do you have your, um, are you able to share uh, your screen? Yep, yep, I okay. think I'm able to share my screen. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. So, uh, can you see the screen? Yes, 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 okay. I can. Yeah, okay, Thank yeah, you. okay, yeah. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to present a couple of studies in my group published in the last few years. And the central theme here is um, look at the climate through the spectral dimension. And what I'm going to present will be focused on the modeling study. But actually, this spectral dimension really have a very strong observational tie there, which I will go back or reiterate uh, at my conclusion slides. 
So just a couple of slides to set up the stage. So for this group of audience, uh, I do not need to explain what is the radiance, what is the flux. So basically the radiance is what we can observe from satellite platform. And the flux is really the angular integration of the radiance. And when we talk about the flux, you, you can talk them at a different spectral resolution there. So when we do radiation budget study or climate change study, we normally look at the broadband flux, which is long wave, short wave. That basically, it's just one number. You integrate it over a wide, wide frequency range. And we could also have narrowband flux. So that's really the flux, for example, computed from the GCM. So you have a radiation scheme. You look at the D D different spectral band, they are CO2 band, the water vapor band, and you compute the flux. And from each in individual band, you sum them up, then you get the broadband flux. And if you go to even higher spectral resolution, that is what we can observe using the satellite instrument. So that is what we call normally refer as a hyperspectrum resolution there. So that is, is for example, what I showed here is, is a synthetic spectrum at a resolution of a three wave number. And if you sum them up, that's actually give you a flux, which is 288 watts per square meter. So that's the ORR for a typical clear sky in the tropics. Okay. And if you break down this broadband, you can see, for example, from zero to 400 wave num number, that can contribute almost one fifth out to the ORR. And if you look 400 to 600, that contributed to about another one fifth. And that means the far infrared contributed to almost 40% of the ORR in the tropics. And if, if you go to the CO2 band, that contributed to another one fifth. And if you go to this fir first window band in the mid infrared, that contributed to another one fifth to your broadband OR. And for all the other mid infrared band we use extensively in satellite remote sensing, that actually only contributed to another one fifth there. Okay. So that basically say what I, I showed the number here is the narrow band. And you can further go to the details for the hyperspectrum there. And when you sum them up, that really give you the broadband. So whenever you're talking about uh, radiative feedback or radiative flux, there is really an intrinsic dimension of a spectra there. So uh, compared to the broadband flux, the spectral flux or even the band by band flux can be more revealing there. So what I mean more re revealing there is that that can tell you something more about the atmosphere. So let me illustrate this one with uh, an animation here. So, okay. so what, what I plot here is just a spectrum out of the Arctic. And the, you can see when you go through the different spectral channels, the, the, the peak of their weighting function changes. And that's the reason you can use the different channel to probe, to probe the different part of our atmosphere there. Okay. And uh, one key point to be reiterated later is just if you look at the far infrared, the peak is really in the upper and the middle troposphere. And when you go to the window ray region on the clear sky, that's really where you can see the surface. And not only in the long wave, even in the short wave, when you look at different spectrum uh, region, you will see different things. And probably the most noticeable for our climate here is actually the dichotomy be be between the visible and the near infrared. So what I mean dichotomy there is say, if you look at the visible, there are almost no gas absorption there. And if you look at the near infrared, there are considerable water vapor absorptions. And not only that, the high latitude surface usually have a very different albedo between the visible and the near infrared. So the snow and the ice is much more reflective in the visible than in the near infrared. And that can also create a spectral signature. Okay. So uh, I will actually, uh, due, due to the time limitation, I will use two examples here, both related to, to, to the long wave spectrum to illustrate this merit of spectral dimension here. And the, the first one is actually a study we published recently for how the spectral solar irradiance can affect the climate simulation there, just the spectral dimension there. So due to the limitation, I will skip it, but if you are interested, you, you can check out this paper. And in one sen sentence, the merit of the spectral dimension is really say, it can reveal the compensation biases, which cannot be revealed 
from your broadband diagnostics or evaluation. And I will try to use two examples to illustrate this point. So I will skip this short wave study. Okay. So let's just look the long wave cloud feedback okay. and think about how the spectral dimension can help us here. And all you need is just con contrast the far infrared absorption and the mid infrared win window. So for the clear sky, I, as I mentioned, the peak of the weighting function for far infrared is somewhere in the upper troposphere. And for the mid infrared window re region, the, the peak of the weighting function is right at the surface for clear sky. Okay. So now let's think if you put a high cloud like cloud A here and you change it. Okay. Now when you change it, you really can see the readings of flux change in both far infrared and mid infrared. However, if you have a cloud, for example, here, it, which is a low cloud and you change it, okay, you will still see the change in mid infrared, but you won't be able to see its change in far infrared. The, the reason is straightforward because most of the emissions originated from lower troposphere. It won't go into the top of atmosphere in far infrared. They will be absorbed somewhere in the upper troposphere. Okay. So let's use this physical contrast between the far infrared and the mid infrared ready to try and transfer to look at some detail of the cloud feedback. So what I showed here is on the upper panel, that's a simulation in the CSN1. Okay. So that is what we derive so called the short term long, long wave cloud feedback. So that is CSM. And on the right, that's what we can derive from observation for the same period of time. And if you look at the spatial pattern and if you look at the global mean number, they are very similar. And for the same GCM, if you do the long term slap ocean run, you calculate the cloud feedback from the long, long term, regardless of the double CO2 or quadruple CO2. The long wave radio feedback is also very close to what you derived from this short wave simulation. Both are 0.19 watts per square meter per K. So does that mean the long wave and the short term long wave, uh, I'm sorry, the short term and the long term long wave cloud feedback are exactly the same? Uh, it might not be the case. So when we decompose this broadband feedback, okay, try to look what's the contribution from each individual band. So on the left and the right, actually the information are, are comparable. So if you just Look, one simple question, what's the contribution from all the far infrared band and what's the contribution from the mid infrared window region? You can see for the short term run and the observation, you have more contribution coming from the middle infrared rather than infrared. However, for the long term run or the 2K uniform warming run, you will see comparable contribution from both medium infrared and the far infrared. So remember the broadband number from long-term and the short-term simulation are nearly identical for this one GCM, but actually the contribution is different. So does this make sense? Uh, if you look at the cloud response, just see the change of cloud fraction per 1K change of global mean surface temperature, you will see when you do the long-term run, you'll see majority of the change in the high cloud. Okay. And that is consistent with the FAT hypothesis. Basically, your cloud fraction got re reduced here and got increased here. You elevated the high cloud. And, but for the near-term run, for this 10-year period, you will see you actually have all, also very noticeable change in low cloud. And remember, whenever you change low cloud, you will see it's in the medium infrared, but not that far infrared. However, if you change high cloud, you will see equi equivalently in far infrared and the mid infrared. So that's really what we see here. Okay. So uh, let me use another example, which is the decomposing of the radiative feedback in the long wave. Okay. So uh, I'll start with, with this chart, probably you, you have seen it many, many times. So this is a chart from hell and the shell. It basically say, if you use relative humidity as a state variable to do the feedback decomposition, the analysis, the spread among GCMs are small, much smaller compared to the specific humidity here. Okay. So for the red humidity, for the left feed and the red humidity feedback, as well as Planck feedback, we can also look at the spectral details of such feedback. So that is uh, back to a paper we published many years ago, which we use the spectral read kernel to look at the spectral details of this relative humidity feedback and the left read feedback. 
And you can see even the red humidity feedback is almost zero, but there are still rich for spectral details there. Okay. So let, let me single two pairs of GCMs. Okay. So on the left, the two GCM has identical lapse rate feedback, the same number. On the right, the two GCM has identical relative humidity feedback. But if you look at this spectral decomposition, you will see they actually are quite different in terms of the spectral details there. So that implies this broadband number has been achieved by some contributions there. Okay. So how we could understand or reveal such compensating contributions? One thing you can do is for this x-axis, which is the frequency, but for each spectral interval there, we remember their Jacobian or their weighting function could peak at a different level of in the atmosphere. So that means we can restore the spectral intervals there, just show them with respect to the peak of the weighting function. And at the same time, just like the broadband feedback analysis, we, we can also estimate or calculate what's the contribution for different level to this feedback. Okay. So that is what we end up with here. So for this two GCM, they have identical broadband lapse rate feedback there. Okay. But if you, you do such decomposition with respect to the peak of the weighting function, and you calculate what's the temperature contribution from different vertical layers to this feedback at different channels, that is the two plot you, you will get. Okay. So we can first look at here. Okay. So this is the channels basically in the median frag. Uh, in the other clear sky, they were sensitive to only the surface. But if you look at the all sky lapse rate feedback, they actually have contribution all the way from the surface to the upper troposphere. The reason is straightforward because you look at the all sky, you have cloud. Whenever you have cloud, you effectively elevate the function to the cloud top. So that's the reason you will see contribution everywhere. Okay. However, if you look at the channels sensitive to the upper troposphere, you won't see any contribution from the lower level because it's just can only originated from here. And if you take the difference between the two upper panels that give you this lower panel plot, that really tells you this identical lapse rate between these two GCM is due to the compensating contributions from the upper troposphere from 400 to 200 hyperpascal and the middle troposphere humidity there. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, mid middle troposphere temperature there. Okay. So for the same story, you can decompose the relative humidity feedback and see what's the contribution. And for the example I, I showed here, you can see for this CIFR GCM, they have a much negative relative humidity feedback Troposphere that actually contributed to what we, we see for the window re region here. And on the opposite, if you go to the upper troposphere, actually they have a much stronger relative humidity feedback than the GFDL. That's the reason why you sum them up all together, you actually have uh, identical relative humidity feedback in terms of the broadband. And the other point out is for the diagnostics I showed here is actually in the 10 wave number spectral interval. And if you, re, if you increase the spectral resolution there, for example, from 10 to two wave number there, you could reveal more ver vertical detail there. That's actually have an implication for observation. So just to sum up, uh, in one sentence, the spectral dimension here is really the bridge between the broadband the diagnostics and the, your geophysical or meteorological field. And because that can really help you reveal the compensating biases there. And the, even you just output the band by band flux from GCM, that actually can already tell you much more information than the broadband alone. And that change from a practical perspective is, is very straightforward. You just output a faulty number rather than just the one number from your radiation scheme, then you will get a lot of information there. And if you want to go to the hyperspectrum, that actually the spectral radio kernel can also help you do the diagnostics. And let me go back to the observation because uh, if you only look at the models, that probably not the, the whole picture. And you have to go back to look at the observations. And actually that's what we have quite a few years to develop this scheme. And using this scheme, we actually can provide the spectrally resolved OLR over the air's observations. And that actually is a part of their level three product. If you are interested, you can just go to the NASA deck and search this keyword and you can download the data and play with, with, 
with it. And in the next, uh, just in this coming decade, we actually have a quite a few mi mission dedicated to measure the far infrared. And also I want to mention for Libra, which is the Earth's continuity mi mission for the radiation budget measurement. It actually will have a dedicated near infrared channel to measure the near infrared flux, which actually can help us to understand the short wave path. Okay, so I will put my reference here and I will stop and take questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Shang Wei. That was really interesting. Um, are there any questions for Shang Wei? Oh, I see there's one from Dennis Hartman. Uh, would you suggest modelers save spectral information in their data sets? If so, what is the optimal number of channels? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a great question. Question. So if we want to go hyperspectrum, that means the model really have to have a satellite to simulate, to simulate the radiance. So that would take a lot of effort. However, each GCM, they have their own radiation scheme. For example, the RTM has 14 bands. That means from the model, you can directly output the narrow band of flux over 14 different spectral bands. And from observation, we can sum up the hyperspectrum observation to match exactly that 14 band. So basically say the whatever broadband diagnostics you have you you have been using in GCM can be easily extended without any simulator effort to band by band diagnostics. And the observational ones that's readily available. Okay. Okay, great. Um, Mark Zelenka asks, how reliable are the trends in the nearly 20 year hyperspectral long wave data set you've created? Uh -huh, Sounds like uh -huh. a powerful data set to use um, alongside series EBAF. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, we have a paper uh, two years ago, we look the spectral trend from our data set over Antarctic. And the, if you look at that paper, we have a comparison of the trend with the series. And uh, when we sum up our broadband flux, we uh, sum up our spectral flux, we basically can, can get the same trend as the series. So, yeah. yeah. Maybe following up on Dennis's question, I was wondering, mm -hmm. so you were showing mm -hmm. these, uh, seem like very resolved, um, spectral feedbacks from a number of different models. Um, did you mm -hmm. get that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the, the plots here. Are these from your kernels mm -hmm. or uh, did you get this data yes. from the yes. modeling centers? Oh, no, uh, this is from our kernels. So basically we have a spectral radiative kernel and you can apply it to monthly mean climate out model output, just like the broadband radiated kernel, then you can get such a spectral de detail and try to make a comparison with observations. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's really neat. Um, okay, I think we're going to move on to the to maybe a general Q&A. Uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion in the chat about the um, forcing uh, in two times CO2 versus half CO2 simulations, which I'd really encourage everyone to check out if you haven't been following it, lots of interesting discussion. Um, and yeah, I guess now we're, we're just opening it up for, for a general discussion. Um, maybe, Jonah, do you want to summarize some of the discussion in the chat? Well, I think, I think my understanding of it is that there's, I guess there's, there's a couple different uh, questions. One is about the change in the instantaneous rate of forcing with uh, with CO two level, and I guess, it, and then also with the uh, effective rate of forcing for for CO two level. Um, and I think that there's there. My understanding is that there there has been work to try to use line by line calculations and maybe simple models of stratospheric adjustment to try to get at some of these. Uh, ideas from first principles, uh, but there's, I don't think, you know, we tried to do a somewhat systematic intercomparison of estimates of radiative forcing between having and doubling and quadrupling CO2, but we were, you know, we were just using regression estimates, which Torsten pointed out is, you know, that, that's going to give you a lot of noise. So it, it would be great if there was some sort of systematic uh, sets of fixed SST runs for for a number you know across across models to estimate these changes in forcing. I I, I think Jen was was responding more specifically about uh, 
about uh, their results. I uh, about, about her about her results in um, CSM one. Did did you end up getting about a ten percent change in the rate of forcing of the effective rate of forcing between level? Yeah, and I think this actually relates nicely to Jean Lay's talk as well, because these line by line calculations aren't necessarily relevant for the forcing that's being experienced in a climate model that doesn't resolve all, all of those lines and have that spectral information. So I think it's really model, probably model dependent. I've learned a lot about this since I gave like a kind of naive talk about this, um, like maybe four years ago, and I still find it so confusing. So. Somebody wants to, I think the Forster 2016 paper is really relevant. Um, I thought your paper was really good, Jonah, like, but you know, I think there's still a need to really clearly explain what's going on. Yeah, I, 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 I was, I thought that, that um, those methods that you were showing Shanley about using the spectral information seemed really quite interesting for, but you know, also for looking at potentially that what what exactly spectrally is causing the change in the changes in these feedbacks and forcing under different conditions. Um, I I don't know if um, yeah, I, I, it would be great if there was some degree of standardization between models, but this that I guess that seems like a bit of of, of a challenge in, in being able to do that sort of looking. Uh, so is this question for me or? Uh, I guess, I, I'm sorry, I guess uh, that was more of a, of a comment. I'm... Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So let me just add my own perspective on this one. So uh, in my opinion, the, the great value of this spectra is really just uh, help you to review what's going on in the broadband. Because when you look at the broadband, it's really a two-dimensional field. When you look at the spectral information, that gives you another dimension, which is directly related to the vertical information or vertical distribution in our atmosphere. That's really the value of this additional dimension can help us to achieve additional diagnostics there. So, Shengli, are your spectral radio kernels publicly available? At least I wasn't aware of them until today. Uh, actually, yes. You can just go our website and you can down, download it. And uh, yeah, but that's only for the uh, only for the long wave and uh, for the for the cloud radio kernel, we actually have built 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 it for both long wave and long wave and the short wave. And the, the bandwidth is the same as the RTM G band. So, awesome, thanks. Um, well, it's coming up to the hour. Um, yeah, I don't know, uh, Jonah. Should we wind things down? Sure. Unless does does anyone have any more questions for our speakers today? Um, maybe if not, let's let's thank them. That was a that, that was a really great series of talks. Thank you all for for uh, for your talks, and thank you everyone for coming. And uh, please let us know if anyone wants.